and we're live. Cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Timur. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this month's audio programmer meetup. Um, it's great to be back here again. Um, so today, me and Josh are hosting again. And we also have two wonderful guests, um, Alan Lee and Vlad Voina. Um, hello, how are you doing? Good, good. Hello. Good. It's so great to have you here. Um, so yeah, before we get to you, we have a few announcements. Um, first of all, as you know, the Audio Developer Conference is happening next month. Um, actually, as of yesterday, the program is online. So if you go to audio.dev slash schedule, you can check out the Audio Developer Conference program. There's a few talks that we will announce later, but it's definitely already mostly taken shape. So I encourage you to ch check it out. And I hope to see you all at the Audio Developer Conference um, ADC next month. And Josh, I think you have another announcement about related to that as well. Yeah, so as Timur said, we have the audio conference. It's only one month away, a little bit over one month away. So if you haven't had your if you haven't received your ticket yet, please go to audio.dev and there will be a link there where you can register. Uh, also, we are calling or we're going to make a public call for volunteers right now. So we're looking for volunteers for ADC to help us essentially serve as uh, Teamer described it as a virtual help desk. So if people are having problems finding out where they need to virtually go, or if they're uh, having trouble linking onto the Remo platform, then these will be people that will essentially help uh, help the attendees get to the right place. And the great benefit is that you will get a free ticket to ADC as well. So you'll be able to be there uh, watching the talks as well. And so we need quite a few volunteers. Uh, the person to email is uh, Celine, and I have put her email in the description of this live video. So her, her email is Celine at audio.dev, and I've put that in the description. So please email her uh, if you're interested in vol volunteering for ADC and interested in helping put this amazing conference together. Uh, as always, we also want to give a big thanks to our sponsors that help make this conference possible. So we have Sonux, we have Juice, and we have Focusrite. So thank you to our sponsors for helping to make this possible. Be sure to support our sponsors. It means a lot uh, that they are um, helping us out with this. Uh, also, another thing that I thought would be great for us to mention is that, uh, as you can see, we've reduced the amount of speakers to two speakers for, per month rather than three. And uh, uh, Timur and I had a discussion about this recently, and we thought that it would be better uh, it, to have a shorter meetup because those we were doing some three three-hour sessions that were going quite deep into the night, and we felt that it was pretty exhausting for us and also probably pretty exhausting for people that were watching as well. So we thought that we could cut it down to two and then we could, um, and, and that it would be better for everybody that way. Um, last announcement is to be sure to uh, join our audio programmer community. So we have a discord community of over 4,000 audio developers from across the world and all different skill levels and uh, we ask each other questions, help each other with uh, all matters, audio programming, and you can come join us. Uh, it's free and you can join it at uh, the audioprogrammer.com forward slash community. And once again, the link is in the description below. So with that, uh, I'm done and we're ready to jump into our first speaker. Yeah. So before I do that, just a couple more things. So people are asking on the chat, will there be recordings from the conference? So good news. Um, ADC, the main track is actually going to be live streamed, um, even for those who are not participating in a conference. Um, and then uh, the rest will be on YouTube afterwards. So uh, all the content will be published afterwards after the conference. Yeah. Um, another announcement is that um, we're not only just looking for volunteers, but we're also looking for one more person to join our code of conduct team. So we have a code of conduct team. Um, which is this year, Celine um, and Alan as well, who is here with us today. And we are looking for one more person to join the Code of Conduct team. So if you're up for doing that, then please also email Celine at Celine at audio.dev. Yeah. Um, and with that, um, let's uh, get to our first speaker, Alan. Um, so Alan, um, thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight. 
Alan is a hardware and software engineer doubling in audio programming. And Alan is going to uh, present tonight about building a spatial audio plugin. Yes, so we have this talk pre-recorded and now I'm going to, uh, to do that right now. And here we go. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. My name is Alan Lee and I am going to be talking to you today about how I created my own spatial audio plugin. Uh, before we get started, I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, I am not by any means an expert when it comes to spatial audio. Uh, I was introduced to the topic about a couple of years ago now, and I've dabbled with it on and off uh, since then. Uh, at the time, I was creating a lot of scripts in Python to do spatial processing offline, and so I thought it would be really nice uh, to have something that acts a lot more real time. Uh, I never created a plugin before too, and so I thought this was a really good opportunity for me uh, to get my feet wet, and also an opportunity for me to uh, get more acquainted with the Juice framework. There are spatial audio plugins out there in the wild um, that will uh, do what my plugin does, but except a lot better, I'm sure. But I just wanted to have the thrill of creating my own plugin. So this talk is called Building a Spatial Audio Plugin, uh, but when you take a closer look at the processing, essentially what it boils down to is you're just applying filters. And so I thought maybe it might be more appropriate to call my talk how to apply FIR filters with extra steps. But building a spatial audio plugin certainly sounds uh, a lot more exciting. So this slide shows three different iterations uh, of my plugin that I call Orbiter. And I'm just gonna take you on a really brief tour of the plugin. Now, unfortunately, um, I believe due to the way that audio is compressed uh, in, an, in a video file, a lot of the spatialization uh, effects get lost. And so if there was audio playing, it would really just sound like it was panning between the left and the right ears. Uh, but I still think it's worth it just to show um, the, you, the GUI elements and the general function of the, uh, the plugin. So this orange circle here that changes to green whenever I hover over it, this represents the audio source. Um, the white circle here represents my head, and I'm faced towards this zero degree mark. Now this audio source uh, is movable, so if I move it to this area, then audio would sound like it's coming from behind me and to the left. And if I pl placed it over here, it would sound like it's coming from behind me and to the right. Uh, over here, audio would sound like it's coming from in front of me and to the right. And here, audio would sound like it's coming from directly in front of me. I have this elevation slider here, and what that does is it changes the, um, the height of the um, audio source. Over here you can set the input and output gain parameters um, and I have a few sliders um, that can change the reverb parameters. We'll get into why this section exists um, a little bit later on in the talk. Uh, finally, this uh, open sofa button here. When I created the plugin, I wanted the user to have the ability to supply their own spatial data uh, parameters. Um, as things stand right now, this plugin will actually not spatialize audio until you feed in what's called a sofa file. And that file contains data um, that says how audio should be spatialized. And so we'll talk more about this mysterious sofa file uh, a little later on in the talk. So today I am going to be talking to you about two main things. Uh, first, I am going to give a very, very brief introduction to spatial audio uh, and some of the component, excuse me, the uh, concepts that pertain the most to the Orbiter plugin. Um, and then we're gonna go into the nitty gritty of the plugin development. So let's start with spatial audio. Spatial audio in this context refers to creating the illusion of being able to determine the direction of an audio source, even when it doesn't exist in real life. So let's take an example here with the, uh, the head and the bird. If we were walking in the woods somewhere and we hear a bird chirp, we are generally able to determine that the bird is probably to the right and a bit above us. And so spatial audio is about recreating that sort of illusion. 
So there are a number of ways that um, this illusion can be created. Uh, one really popular way that I'm sure many of us are aware of is through surround sound. Um, and that just refers to having uh, multiple speakers placed in different areas and having different bits of audio uh, mapped to those speakers. The other way is through uh, what's called wave field synthesis. And if my understanding of this method is correct, it's a little analogous to how in the Fourier series, uh, complex waveforms can be decomposed into simpler sinusoidal components. Um, and so in here, in the loudspeaker array, um, each loudspeaker is emitting a simple wavefront. But the collection, the summation of those simple wavefronts will result in the complex wavefront um, that is emitted by, say, a car or a bird. And so with this method, uh, you're also able to create uh, localization, uh, localized sounds as well, too. Finally, the last method is binaural reproduction. Um, this is the method that is actually employed by the Orbiter plugin. And so I'm going to be talking about this a little bit more. So where surround sound used multiple speakers um, to achieve the spatialization effect, uh, binaural reproduction um, reproduces spatial audio using only your headphones. And so the idea behind binaural reproduction is to change the time of arrival um, and the levels of the sound uh, in each ear. So let's take a closer look. Um, in the bottom left here, we have a speaker uh, set up right in front of the left ear. And so when a sound is emitted from the speaker, excuse me, when the sound is emitted in front of the speaker, the sound is going to reach the left ear first. Um, now on the journey towards the right ear, excuse me again, on the journey towards the right ear, um, because the head's in the way, the head is actually going to attenuate uh, that signal. And so what the right ear hears is a attenuated and delayed version of what the left ear hears. Um, and in the middle, uh, looking at this chart here, um, this is kind of like a graphical uh, representation of what we just talked about. So in blue, we have the, the uh, signal that the left ear hears, and the orange is the signal that the orange, uh, excuse me, the right ear hears. And, if, and sure enough, um, the right ear gets an attenuated and delayed version of what the left ear is hearing. Um, and so our brain is able to take those differences in time of arrival and levels and determine the location of the audio source. These differences um, in time and levels is referred to as intraoral uh, time difference and intraoral uh, level difference. And those two quantities uh, are encoded in what's called the head-related impulse response. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing here in this chart. Uh, this speaker uh, emits an impulse, and special microphones uh, fitted in the ears uh, pick up that response. So if we move this speaker around and play impulse response in a 360-degree field and plotted them in a uh, 3D graph, we would get something like this. So these are... Um, a collection of impulse responses recorded as the speaker uh, moved around the head. And so on the y-axis, we have the azimuth, the angle uh, where the speaker is placed. On the x-axis here, we have the time. And so starting at zero degrees, the speaker is in right in front of us. And so we see that the time of arrivals is relatively the same and relatively at the same levels. Now, as the speaker moves towards the left ear, we find that the level, uh, the impulse level that the left ear hears is at its maximum, but the level heard at the right ear is at its minimum. Moving the speaker towards the back of the head, we find that um, the levels and the time of arrivals are roughly the same. And moving the speaker further towards the right ear, we find that the opposite has happened. We find that the level at the left ear is now at its minimum, and the level at the right ear is at its maximum. And moving the speaker uh, back to the front, we see that the time of arrivals are roughly the same, uh, and the levels are also roughly the same as well. So this chart on the right here shows uh, an approximation of the time of arrival of the impulse. And so we see the same thing here. At zero degrees, 
the time of arrivals uh, are the same. Um, and also at the back of the head when the speaker is uh, moved closer to the back of the head. Um, around the, as the speakers move towards the left ear, we see that the time of arrival of the left ear is less than the right ear. And after the speaker moves 180 degrees, the right ear now experiences um, a, a shorter time of arrival than the left ear. So the time of arrival and difference, uh, level differences are actually not the only cues that your brain uses to localize sound. Um, there's actually um, a lot of other cues um, that are used, but this is another big one. Um, it turns out that your outer ear, the shape of your outer ear, plays a big effect in localization as well. And so the ridges and valleys in your outer ear um, will essentially filter out different frequencies. And so that filter character, that, that frequency characteristic, is um, also encoded in the um, in the impulse response. Uh, but in order to see that frequency spectrum, you will have to take the Fourier transform of the head-related impulse response. And that gives us the head-related transfer function. Um, and for those of you who have been reading a little bit in uh, spatial audio literature, I'm sure this is a term that comes up quite frequently. So it turns out that this frequency spectrum is actually not constant. It changes uh, with the azimuth. And so this chart, these two charts here, uh, show are, are similar to the, uh, the collection of impulse responses that we were looking at in the previous slide, except now we're just looking at the frequency domain version uh, of those impulses. And understandably, when the speaker is uh, moved towards the left ear, uh, a lot of the frequency components do get passed. But when the speaker is moved towards the right ear, because of the shadowing effects of the head, a lot of the higher frequency components get attenuated. And so your brain does uh, spectral processing as well um, to as part of the localization process. So how are uh, HRTFs measured? Uh, personalized HRTFs, uh, the traditional way is by sitting in an anechoic chamber with a speaker in front of you. And then that speaker would play some sort of impulse and special microphones attached to your ears would pick up that impulse. Then you would be moved uh, by some number of degrees, and the measurement process repeats. Uh, the, alternatively, you can have um, an array of speakers, um, so you wouldn't have to be rotated. Um, and so different speakers at different azimuths uh, would emit impulses. Um, there are also special uh, dummy head microphones, like the one we see uh, here, um, that are fitted with anatomically correct models of the outer ear. And those can be used instead of a real person. Uh, there is some research in computing HRTFs using only 3D scans of the head, uh, but I'm not quite sure how well that works. And if there's anybody out there who does, uh, please let me know, because I would love to know. So if you have a HRTF and applied it, to, um, to an audio signal, it turns out that uh, the resulting audio signal sort of sounds like it comes from inside your head. And it turns out that um, the reverberant properties of a room is actually quite important in externalizing um, the audio. And so one way to solve this is by moving the measurement setup inside an actual room. And so HRTFs that have uh, room characteristics encoded in it are typically called binaural room impulse responses. And we kind of see a, uh, an example, a uh, measurement setup example, uh, right here. Now that we have our HRTF measurements, the question then is, how should they be stored? And if we were working with uh, a small number of HRTFs, you know, two, four, or six HRTFs, uh, then it's not a bad idea to put them in a uh, uncompressed audio file. But suppose we had 360 degrees uh, worth of HRTFs, uh, each separated by one degree. So then that will be 360 times two years. Uh, that's 720 impulse responses in total. And so the previous solution doesn't become very scalable. So it would be really nice uh, to have some kind of file format that allows aggregation of those impulse response in one file. 
And it turns out there is such a file format called the SOFA file format. SOFA standing for Spatially Oriented Format for Acoustics. Uh, this is an AES standard, uh, so if any of you are interested in reading the standard, uh, it's AES 69-2015. You can find that on the AES.org website. The, for, the, excuse me, the SOFA file format is a specification that details how um, impulse responses should be stored and organized. But impulse responses actually aren't the only, uh, sort of the only information that's stored in the SOFA file. It turns out that um, information about the measurement setup, so things like what sampling frequency was used, the number of measurements taken, the length of each impulse response, all of that also lives in the SOFA file. So one interesting thing to note is that the SOFA file is based on NetCDF, which in turn is based off of uh, HDF5. So you could use the HDF5 library to read SOFA files. Now, if we took a closer look at the contents of a SOFA file, we would find that the data is organized uh, similar to this. Now, this isn't all of the data that, um, that's in the SOFA file. Uh, these are just sort of the main objects that are of interest to us. So the impulse responses are stored in a one-dimensional array. Um, so if we had 360 impulse responses, uh, or rather 360 degrees worth of impulse responses, then the array size would be 360 times two years uh, times the length of each impulse response. And so you can see that this array can get really big really quickly. Source position and listener position uh, contain lists of the coordinates of the sources and listeners. So for example, if in my measurement setup, I only had four speakers, one in front, left, back, and to the right, then in the source position, there would be a list of the coordinates of those speakers. M refers to the number of measurements taken. Uh, N refers to the length of each uh, impulse response. And C is a constant, which refers to the number of dimensions um, in the uh, coordinates. So us living in a three spatially dimension world, that number would be three. There are a number of libraries out there that will read SOFA files, uh, but I wanted to go through the exercise of writing my own library. And this library that I call libbasicsofa warrants a talk on its own, but I am going to be skimming over the finer details and just give a very brief overview of this library. So libbasicsofa is a very bare bones library that will read in a sofa file and extract its information and dump its contents into memory. There are some functions exposed, so if I, for example, I want to retrieve uh, an impulse response for a certain channel, that is left ear or right ear, uh, for a certain radius, azimuth, and elevation angle, then the libbasicsofa object will calculate where that impulse response is in memory and return a pointer to the start of that impulse response. Looking a little bit under the hood, um, one of the main challenges to libbasicsofa is because the input parameters are a coordinate, that's the radius, azimuth, and elevation, uh, in order to find where that impulse response will start, there is a mapping that needs to be done to convert that coordinate into an index, uh, an array index. And so what happens is when I pass in a coordinate, first the radius is extracted. Uh, the radius is a key for a stud unordered map. And so based on the radius value, it'll return an index to what's called a coordinate map array. So the index of um, an impulse response for a given elevation and azimuth is stored in a 2D array that I call the coordinate map. Now, for one radius, the range of, say, the azimuth can range from, for example, uh, 0 degrees to 180 degrees, but for another radius, it could range from 0 to 360 degrees. So that range is not constant between two uh, radii. And so for this reason, each radius is associated or has its own coordinate map associated with it. And that's why we store um, the coordinate maps in an array. 
So next, the elevation angle, or phi, is entered into uh, a phi map, uh, another stud unordered map object, and it returns the row of the coordinate map where our um, impulse response will start. And then finally, it'll take the azimuth angle, or theta, goes through another map, and that will return the column. And so using the row and column, you're able to determine the location where the impulse response starts in data.ir, the array that stores the impulse responses. So on to the good stuff. Um, this slide here shows the overall high-level architecture of the Orbiter plugin. So we went through libbasic sofa already, um, and so an instance of this lives in plugin processor. Um, so plugin processor and plugin editor are the two source uh, source files um, in Juice uh, that we manipulate um, to create our plugin. So when the source position in the UI is changed. That will trigger the plugin processor to find the appropriate, the corresponding uh, head-related impulse response. And once it finds that, it'll pass it into the HRTF processor. And this is where the input audio is actually uh, applied with, or rather the HRTF is applied with the input audio. Just a quick note about the um, audio I.O. Um, the input audio into the plugin is going to be uh, only one channel, so it's going to be mono. Uh, and because the output is going to be binaural, of course it's going to be a stereo signal. So at its simplest, applying HRTFs can be as simple as uh, applying a finite impulse response filter. Um, it can be easy, as easy as using the Juice DSP FIR filter class, um, and for the coefficients, the values would just be the um, the impulse response. Um, unfortunately, uh, because of the features that I wanted to implement in the uh, Orbiter plugin, uh, I can't exactly get away with doing just that. So there are two main ways to implement FIR filters. Uh, one of them is the time domain convolution approach. And you would basically implement a filter structure like this. Um, essentially what this is, is it's a shift register type of structure. And you would input audio samples uh, one by one. And at each iteration, you would multiply the shift register elements with the values of the impulse response. Summate them and you get one output sample. And then you would continue to do this for all of the rest of the samples. The problem with this approach is that it's quite inefficient. Um, and so a better way to um, to do this processing is what's called frequency domain conv convolution. Excuse me. Um, in this approach, you're taking the Fourier transform of the input signal, and you take the Fourier transform of the head-related impulse response. You would multiply the resulting frequency spectrums together, uh, and then take the inverse to get the resultant time domain uh, signal. So this um, class of processing in the frequency domain um, is typically referred to as spectral audio signal processing. Um, and for those of you who have worked extensively with this, I'm sure a lot of the techniques that we'll be talking about here um, are going to be very familiar to you. So um, as a start, um, I'm going to be uh, using frequency domain convolution. And at its simplest, this is what the processing uh, process is going to look like. So from process block, we'll have a block of samples, which will have a gain applied to it. Those samples will get added into a zero padded buffer. And then the contents of this buffer will go through the Fourier transform. And then the HRTF gets applied. The inverse Fourier transform um, is run. And then the resultant process output signal is sent to the output buffer. Seems simple enough. There's a couple of uh, interesting things, uh, interesting blocks um, that I haven't covered yet. One of them is the zero padded buffer, and the other one is the overlap and add block. And so I'm going to be talking about those in a little bit more detail, starting with overlap and add. So overlap and add is a technique that's commonly used, especially when the signal is particularly long or in real time systems where we don't know what the future uh, audio samples will be. And so the idea behind overlap and add is this. We take a signal, 
like this. And then we split it up into blocks of equal size. Then you take one of those blocks, in this example I've taken block 1, and we run some processing through it. And we get this time domain processed result. Then what you would do is you take this result and you add it into what's called an overlap and add buffer. But you don't start the addition at index 0 in the overlap and add buffer. What you have to do is you have to shift it by k samples. And so what's k? Well, suppose the block size was 512 samples. Because we are working, work, excuse me, because we are working with the second block, then k is actually 512. And so you would have to first shift the process result by 512 samples before you add it in with the previous, um, the previous block, the previous process block, excuse me. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, we have the signal here up top that we split into three blocks. We take the first block and we process it and we have this resulting waveform. It, this is the overlap and add buffer. We do the same thing with block 1 and we take the processed uh, output and then we shift it by a block size of samples. And then we do the same thing with block 2. Now I haven't quite uh, added the uh, results of block 1 and block 2 into the overlap and add buffer yet. But when I sum these, then you would get this resultant waveform in green. And so this waveform looks the same as if you had taken these three blocks and process processed it all at once. And that's sort of the magic of overlap and add processing. Uh, one interesting thing to note is that the number of samples in the processed uh, output is not the same as the number of samples in the input. Uh, we're going to touch on that a little bit more uh, later on. But essentially what happens is that you would take the, th this sort of tail would get added with the processed, the values of the processed block in the next block. And that's where the overlap, um, part of the overlap in overlap, come overlap and add comes from. So the overlap and add buffer in theory would be infinite in length. Um, or at least the size of your audio uh, audio file, but practically speaking, that's not exactly doable. Um, and so the overlap and add buffer is implemented as a circular buffer. And so what happens here is we have uh, process block 0 and 1. Uh, once we process our next block, that gets added into the overlap and add buffer. And then the oldest process block gets erased. Uh, hopefully the contents of that block is added to, to an output buffer somewhere or is used in some manner. Then when it comes time to increment the uh, empty block index, that just wraps around to the beginning of the overlap and add buffer. So that's overlap and add. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, zero padding. And so remember that in the past couple of slides, the number of samples in the output uh, in the processed output is actually not the same as the uh, number of samples in the input. And so that's because if you have a signal length of P and an impulse response length of Q, when you convolve the two signals, the processed signal length is going to be P plus Q minus 1. And so the FFT size that you use should be at least that length. Well, why is that? Suppose we had, in this example here, we had a signal of length 128. And our filter uh, response was of length 32. And so if we had used uh, an FFT, FFT size of 128, what happens is, at the 129th sample, the convolution wants to write the output at the 129th position but we only have 128 uh, spaces to work with. And so what the convolution does is that it will wrap around to the beginning of the processed output and corrupt the first few uh, samples. And so this phenomenon is called time aliasing. Now, if we had used 
a size, uh, an FFT size of 120 plus 32, uh, 160, usually we use the next power of 2 available. Um, so if we had used a size of 256, uh, we wouldn't have this issue. And so what does the implementation actually look like? Well, we have these things called uh, zero padded buffers. Um, and so each of these buffers would be of size 256. And so we would take the IR and place that into the zero padded buffer. After the 30 second sample, everything is going to be zero. And that's where the zero in zero padded comes from. Likewise, we would take the signal and transfer it into the signal zero padded buffer. And so the process signal will fit comfortably inside um, the, its associated zero padded buffer. So these two components are essentially what you need um, to carry out spectral audio signal processing for FIR filters. Uh, but there is one minor detail that uh, kind of throws a wrench into our plans. And that's the fact that the source position uh, can change. And so when the source changes, or rather the position of the audio source changes, that means your impulse response changes. And that means your filter characteristics change. And so when that happens, you run a risk of encountering uh, click noises or zipper noises. And so here, on the left, we see that we have an abrupt change of the HRTFs, which gives us this really nasty zipper noise um, phenomenon. And so there are a number of ways to, uh, re to mitigate this, uh, but the approach that I chose to use was uh, crossfading. And so what happens is I take a copy of the signal, and one copy gets the old HRTF applied to it. Then it runs through the uh, inverse FFT, and the result actually gets faded out by this sinusoidal envelope. Likewise, another copy is applied, uh, another copy goes through, and um, the new HRTF is applied. Take the inverse FFT, and it's faded in with this cosine signal. And so the total signal is a summation of these faded signals. And so this gives us a much smoother transition in between HRTF changes than if we had abruptly changed them without any crossfading. Uh, it turns out, however, that this actually isn't quite enough uh, to completely remove the clicks and the zipper noises. Um, to resolve that, we need to make two small modifications to the way that we perform overlap and add. And so one of them is to window the um, input signal blocks. Um, so this, so windowing uh, inputs is a common technique uh, used, especially when the filter characteristics are time varying, which is the case uh, when we move the audio source around. And so because when you window uh, the input blocks, the values are of course going to change. And so there's a constraint that we have to meet called constant overlap and add, or COLA. And so what COLA essentially states is if we took one signal and windowed it, and then take another block of signals and windowed that, if you sum the window samples together, then you should get the same input samples as if you didn't have any windowing applied at all. And so that's what we see here. Um, we have one block, and then we have a second block, and when you add them together, you will get this constant um, denoted in this green line. And so I have a succession of uh, Hamming windows, um, which when you sum them together, you get a constant. Now the constant doesn't have necessarily have to be one, um, it just has to be a constant. And that basically just means that you apply a gain or some constant attenuation to the input signal. <coughs> so note that in order to um, satisfy this COLA restriction, the constant restriction, uh, notice that the Hamming window does not start at the end of the first input block. Rather, it starts at the midpoint of the previous block. And so this is the other modification that we have to make in our overlap and add strategy. So looking at this in a little bit more detail, we have this original signal. Um, at the top, this is our previous overlap and add method. And 
It turns out actually that our previous method of overlapping at is actually COLA compliant. Just at the time we were using a rectangular window um, and the next block started at the end of the previous block. But in this approach, we take a block of samples, we apply a window to it and apply the processing that we want to do. For the next block, instead of moving, compared to the previous approach, instead of moving n samples, we move half the amount of samples, carry on with the processing, and so on and so forth. Now because we're moving in smaller increments, this poses a problem in our processing. Because it turns out that if we process uh, one audio block of length n, then the number of usable outputs is actually half that. And so process block would expect n output samples, but we're only able to give uh, half the number, of, uh, half of that. And so we, our audio input actually needs to be uh, two n samples, but process block is definitely not going to give us that. So what do we do? The solution around that is to have an initial buffering stage. And so here we have the state um, of the plugin um, at startup. And so as an example, um, suppose process block will give us 512 samples and expect 512 output samples. And so our input block length needs to be um, 2n plus 1, so 1025 samples. Uh, by the way, the plus 1 comes from the fact that our uh, windowing function is odd and not even. So after startup, at the first process block call, um, 512 samples will be input into the input buffer. But because we haven't met the 1025 sample threshold, nothing happens. At the next call to process block, again, samples are added, but we didn't meet the threshold, so nothing happens. Finally, at the third process block call, we finally have enough samples to initiate processing. And so those 1025 samples get transferred into this signal buffer, and an FFT is run, and processing is done, and we get this resulting signal um, in the overlap and add buffer. Then the uh, first 512 samples are sent out to an output buffer. At the next process block call, 512 samples are added, but we still have a sufficient amount of samples to carry out processing. And so those 1025 samples get transferred, they get processed, and we have an output. So everything's happy and it's chugging along. One last thing that I wanted to note here is uh, Previously, I mentioned that reverberation is uh, important to externalizing um, audio. And so I have a really, th this is a really basic um, approach to solve that problem. Um, essentially what I do is I take um, a copy of the input samples and I apply it to a reverb uh, filter. And then that reverberated output gets um, mixed in with the binaural, uh, output binaural signal. Now if we took a look at our final signal flow, it's going to look something like this. A little bit more involved, uh, but still relatively simple, at least in my opinion. You have the samples coming in with gain applied, which gets placed into an input buffer. If the number of samples meets the threshold, then it will start the processing. And so the samples get windowed, uh, the HRTF is applied, and it goes into an overlap and add buffer, which is then transferred to an output buffer. Uh, a reverberated version of the input signal is added to the output mix, which then goes out into the this output buffer. Now, if there was a HRTF change, then the crossfader would kick in, and the results of that would get added into the overlap and add buffer. So in the next few slides, I want to go through some of the implementation details and look at some of the code in the Orbiter plugin. I wanted to have the ability to change sofa, uh, the sofa files um, during the plugin runtime. And to facilitate that, I decided to wrap up a libbasic sofa object and the HRTF processors into a wrapper class. And so when a new sofa file gets read, this wrapper instance will get swapped with the current uh, instance. Looking at the process block, um, in this section we take the active 
uh, the currently active version of the wrapper class. Um, and then here we add the samples. Um, and these two lines here get the binaural outputs. Now, if the plugin was at its initial stage and um, there weren't enough samples to trigger the processing, uh, then get output will actually return a vector of zeros. This part here is where um, the output is just copied into the output buffer that uh, process block expects. Now, having a closer look at the add samples, this block here uh, essentially just adds samples into the input buffer. And so when enough samples get added into that input buffer, um, the processing is triggered, and that's done largely by calculate output, this function here. So let's have a closer look at that. In calculate output, these two lines will actually remove the oldest uh, processed blocks, like we saw in uh, the slides past. Uh, this part will run the FFT on the input signal, and this part applies the HRTF and performs the inverse uh, FFT. If there was a HRTF change, then this block of code handles the crossfading, and this block handles the overlap and add process. Now, in theory, uh, you can actually get the output samples from the overlap and add buffer, but I wanted to explicitly um, have an output buffer which doesn't have the sort of tails that we've seen um, in the process blocks, uh, since those tails need to have the values of the next process block to be added with. Taking a closer look at the get output function, uh, really the only thing of note here is that uh, we have this um, have the reverberated uh, version of the input uh, that's added to the uh, processed output, and so that's about it for the implementation. Um, talking about some of the future improvements that I want to make to the Orbiter plugin, uh, the first one is adding interpolation um, to uh, in between HRTFs. Um, so some of the SOFA files will have uh, about one degree of separation uh, in the azimuths and elevations, uh, but other files may not necessarily have that, um, that degree of separation. Some of them might be five degrees or ten degrees or even more. Um, and so generally when you have a wider degree of separation, you have less correlation between two HRTFs, and that can run the risk of having the zipper or click sounds. And so it would be nice to have an interpolation stage that will give HRTFs at one degree uh, increments. Uh, the other improvement that I'd like to add is a better reverberation model. Currently, uh, I just use the Juice Reverberator, which is based off of uh, Freeverb. While it more or less does the trick, um, there are certainly ways um, to improve that. Um, I, ideally, I would like to have some kind of model which also incorporates um, applying HRTFs to reflections, but that the computing um, power needed for that is going to be quite high. Uh, the next one is more stable SOFA file support. This really just has to do with how I wrote the code. Uh, currently, when a SOFA file gets read, uh, I get a, a sort of like a default um, impulse responses, but the way I get those default impulse uh, responses is by adding a, is by specifying a uh, default coordinate. And so that default coordinate might not actually exist uh, in a given SOFA file. And so what happens is that the SOFA file load fails uh, because it gets a null pointer returned by the libbasicsofa object. The next one is headphone compensation. Um, the headphones will add some spectral coloring to the binaural mix. Um, so it would be nice to kind of remove that spectral coloration. Uh, I'm not sure how, if this makes a huge difference. Um, again, if somebody out there knows, please let me know. I'd love to find out. Uh, and finally, um, compressed HRTF data files. So SOFA files can get really large really quickly, um, especially in the case uh, where you are in kind of like a spherical measurement setup. And so if there was a way um, to compress the impulse responses, um, and reduce the memory footprint, especially in the case where I'm using this in a DAW, uh, and I have more than one track using the Orbiter plugin, um, having a less memory footprint would certainly be very helpful. So that's it for today's talk. Thank you very much uh, for listening to me.
Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to email me at ailey at meowworkshop.org. Uh, if you want to have a look at the Orbiter and the libbasic sofa code, um, you can find that in my GitHub. Thank you very much again for listening to my talk. Great, thank you, thank you very much, Alan, for your uh, for doing this. That was that was fantastic. Where is everybody gone? Uh, so so I know that uh, Teamer has had to run for a second because he uh, he actually had a problem with his computer, so he's he's probably uh, trying to restart it currently. So we have a couple questions that uh, people are asking. So the first question is from. Um, Oren, and he says, what resources are you utilizing for your research? I'd like to begin looking into audio from a programmatic standpoint and uh, also sound theory. So what, what, uh, what are some research, what are some research uh, resources that you use to learn about these? Um, yeah, so I think um, as far as spatial audio is concerned, um, unfortunately, I feel like there, I, I found that there wasn't um, a lot of uh, resources out there that were, um, that were very approachable. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I first started out, there was this uh, paper in IEEE Explorer. Like it, it, it was a, um, it was a paper that unfortunately, I think you need to be an IEEE member uh, to download. And it sort of gave like a very basic overview of uh, spatial audio. Um, to build on top of that, um, I um, I read a lot of papers from like the the AES, the Audio Engineering Society um, library, as well. Um, and unfortunately, you do um, need to have a membership to access those papers. But um, I, I will say that like <laughs> that was probably like the best hundred twenty dollars I've spent um, as far as like looking for resources went. Uh, so yeah, papers. Um, and also the, as far as like the audio processing stuff goes, I found the, um, the Julius Smith books, um, the one called spectral audio signal processing was really helpful. Um, when actually, when it came down to the implementation. Amazing. Uh, Ismail Salim asks, uh, for your GitHub link. So I know that you mentioned it before. Can you just give it to us again? Just uh, for people. Uh, to... Yeah, sure. Um, so it is uh, my GitHub is well, github.com slash uh, super kittens. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. And I'll, uh, after, after we get done with this, I'll put the link in the description as well. Perfect. Um, Nathan Berwick asks Would you run this interpolation from position A to position B or in between H? each HRIR that is passed? Hmm. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I understand the question, actually. Um, I think I was following this question, actually, um, during, during the talk. Um, and so I, I, think, um, I think by the end, they were, they, he was clarifying if, um, if I was, what happens when I move like the source position from uh, one, uh, from one position to another position that's far away? Um, and the question was if in between those steps, the, um, I guess the intermediate impulse responses were used. Um, and that, that is actually the case. Um, so on its way over, you're gonna go through um, a bunch of HR uh, impulse response changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. and. Uh, there's a question uh, from uh, Imoni asking if there is a large angle discrepancy between HRTFs, what's the best way to interpolate the signal? If they are five degrees apart, how do you separate? How do you simulate one degree of separation? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, in like a simple case, if we were just um, changing angles in a plane. Um, I think you can get away with linear interpolation, um, but things get pretty complicated when you have um, HRTFs that represent different radii, um, and also if you have different elevation angles. So how do you interpolate in uh, 3D? Uh, to be honest, I actually don't really uh, know the answer that, to that question. Um, I did find a paper on um, how that sort of uh, that triangulation uh, is done, but Unfortunately, at this time, I can't really, uh, I won't be able to answer that. Amazing. 
Uh, there was another question about how big are sofa files? Uh, so they can range from the, the, the one that I was using actually was about 400 megabytes. And I believe that was only on, uh, that was taking, that contains information on um, just, just a plane rather than like a whole spherical um, setup. That one I think was around like six to 700 megabytes. So it's a lot of memory. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Pretty big. Uh, and then uh, Alex Grimes has a question if the slides will be available. So uh, would you be able to send me the slides and I can put a link to them in the description as well? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, sounds great. So that appears to be all of the questions that we have. Thank you once again, Alan. That was that was a fantastic spatial audio uh, talk. And uh, and I'll probably have to walk, watch through it a couple times to understand everything. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, definitely follow it. It was definitely a great introduction. Um, it was my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for listening in. Yes. Thank you. Oh, we do have one more question here really quick. Oh, he, he was asking, uh, what the, for those sofa files, how much CPU does that take? Is it pretty CPU intensive to process those? Uh, yeah. When I profile it, uh, the, the reading and the load put, took a hundred percent of my CPU. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So one core was used up uh, completely for that. Amazing. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, thank you. Great. Are you with us, Timur? Yes. So, you know, I love doing this online stuff. Like these unexpected things just happen all the time. Can you hear me now, actually? Yes. Yes. Amazing. So first of all, you might have heard like a dog bark barking during Alan's talk. So that was actually Josh. That was your dog, right? Who wanted to say yeah. hello? Yes. So Toast, Toast, come here. She doesn't want to, she doesn't want to come now. Oh, right. You can see her down here. There she is. Yeah, there she is. So yeah. that. Happened. I love how her name is Toast. Yeah. <laughs> so cute. So if you've if you followed along with the audio programming tutorials, chances are you've you've heard from her at one point or another. She uh she has a way of making herself known in uh, in the videos. So uh, so yeah, she's a uh, she's a guest on the uh, tutorials and the vids on the on the channel sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, she's probably correct in your tiny, uh, you know, uh, mistakes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> if yeah. only you could understand. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, she's uh, she's a C plus plus developer as well. You know. <laughs> yeah. So so that happened, and then uh, you remember when we were doing the meetup in August when I was in Greece? Like I had like a power outage. Yeah. So this time my computer just crashed, and I had to like restart it, and then it was. Re like just towards the end of your talk, Alan, and then it was like rebooting into this recovery mode. And I was like, uh oh, this is not going to work. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so yeah, I have another laptop actually. So, but like it was, um, yeah, it's, it's all a bit, um, yeah. yeah. So this is why I missed the end of your talk and the beginning of the Q and A. And, uh, yeah, this is just stuff that happens when you're doing things online. So yeah. Murphy's law has no mercy. Does it? <laughs> yeah. We this are here. Stuff. Yeah. So yeah, thank you again for um, your talk. Um, and um, let's come to the next speaker, Vlad. So uh, Vlad Voynov, thank you so much for joining us um, tonight. Um, I think, um, oh, by the way, um, if you have questions uh, to Vlad or to Alan or to us, then just feel free to just um, type them into the YouTube chat and prefix them with question in all caps and then we can see it better. And then we're gonna ask your question on the chat. So with that, um, hello, Vlad. Um, so I think hey, I should just, like introduce, yeah, I should like talk a little bit about how this um, session came about. So we actually met at um, Roly, uh, where I joined the Juice team, which was around the beginning of 2015. And then later I moved on from Juice to the Blocks team. And so Vlad and I were actually working directly with each other for a little while. And then after the Blocks release, we both left, we kept in touch. And then about one and a half months ago, I think we had um, dinner together. Sorry, sorry, asking, that's my dog again. <laughs> yeah, and I was just asking Vlad all these questions about, hey, you're a freelancer, how does this work out? How do you do this? How do you do that? And it was just like a dinner conversation, right? And, and then Vlad, you were saying all these things and I was like, huh, this is really interesting. I bet other people would be interested in that too. And so um, then we decided, well, let's just do a Q&A here so that you know, everyone can benefit from you know, hearing about this stuff. So 
this is basically how this came about. So I'm really, really happy that you actually said yes and you decided to join us here. Thank you very much. So why don't you tell us about who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that sort of like little background intro. So um, as, as Timur said, my name is Vlad uh, and uh, not too long after I think after Timo left Roly, yeah, I think it's about a few a, a few months, maybe maybe a bit longer. Um, I decided uh, to go freelance basically, um, and uh, it was around that time. And I also founded uh, my my company, uh, which is called uh, Vocode, um, which I basically run alongside my brother, who's um, playing football now, actually. Uh, where I should have been maybe, <laughs> but uh, yeah, basically uh, we um, we build um, all kinds of uh, music software, or music audio software, anything from plugins to audio apps um, to you know installations. We've we've done a few installations or like audio visual uh, installations. We've even built like a quick. Uh, sort of like video conferencing thing for some clients. So, you know, all, all, all kinds of things. I, I would say probably 99% in the realm of audio, music, video. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's been like maybe like almost two or, two or three years since uh, me and Timur were working at Trolley. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been hell, a hell of a ride. So yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. All right. Uh, can you share anything at all about your current projects or um, apart from what you said? Uh, well, the current project, uh, basically at the moment, um, I have two projects going on. Uh, one is uh, sort of like client uh, external project and one is an internal company project working on our own products. Um, and I, it's like one of those things. I probably not, probably it's safer not not to talk about the current projects. But I can, I can definitely talk about the um, most recent projects. Yeah. Why don't you share something about that? Yeah. So uh, I think in June, it's probably June. Yeah, uh, we released uh, Stutter Edit uh, two actually with uh, um, working with uh, BT. I'm not sure if. Many of you have heard of BT, but he's uh, he's uh, he's basically like I think it, a lot of magazines call him like the parent, like the father of EDM or something like that. One of those sort of like cheesy sort of like names. But basically, Brian is like um, he's like a music tech pioneer essentially. Like he's he's built Stutter Edit like 15 years ago, the first version uh, with with Isotope, or maybe like 10. 10, 10 years and I'm like pushing it too long. And he, uh, he contacted us to um, develop version two, uh, sort of like inherit Stutter Edit one legacy code and, you know, pamper it up, make it, make it, uh, make it future proof and then also add a bunch of whole new features. Uh, so we, uh, we released that in, uh, in June and it's been, it's been out for, for three months now. And um, yeah, it seems it's, it seems to be sort of like holding up. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds like a pretty cool project that you were involved in. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, so I wonder how did you like how did you get into freelancing? Did you just wake up one morning and decided, oh, I want to like quit my job and become a freelancer, or like how does that yeah. come get into it? You know? Yeah, I mean it's. <sighs> I, you know, I always, I think every time someone asks me that question, I probably give a different response, <laughs> but I think I can probably make a, you know, like a summation, like an approximation of all my responses so far. <laughs> and they kind of, they kind of circle in the realm of, you know, it felt right at the time. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I've always wanted to do. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, you know, just sort of like, um, uh, sort of like the main ambition uh, most most of the time this this answer comes into my mind was that I wanted to be able to basically I wanted more 
I wanted to be in control of when I can work on my own projects or on a company's projects and and sort of like ex external client work, which was which is I, I guess it's very difficult to do when when you're in a full time job and it probably also is it's probably not efficient either so yeah I think that was probably the main the main motivation and you know there were there was there was also like I also had a bit of an existential sort of like well not and not okay I'm pushing this too far more of a like professional dilemma uh you know after working for like almost three years at Rolly, i was like oh what next now and this just felt felt like the right next step so but it feels like especially if you were just an employee before where you get like your paycheck every month and it's like safe like jumping into freelance feels like quite a bold kind of thing did you feel uh were you like scared or did you feel like it was like a natural thing to do or uh, yeah, there was definitely a lot of back and forth, you know, sort of like, oh, you yeah, know, yes, no, yes, no. And I remember at the time I was in, I was in talks uh, with my first clients and, you know, they, they knew I was making the, the, the change. So they're really sort of like understand, understanding and patient to sort of like, they, you know, they could, they, they kind of knew it was like, oh, we want to do this, do this. This is how much we can, we can pay. But we know that, you know, you're really giving up um sort of like a monthly paycheck i guess um, but um i would say you know for anyone who's sort of like thinking of doing this it's not uh, i mean really the the logical thing to do is make sure you save up some buffer cash like if that's something you can't do then maybe it's not the right time because it is risky it's going to be stressful like if if you don't if yeah if you can't sort of like buffer up at least like a couple of months of you know sort of like oh i'm willing to work for three months on this possibly on my own projects and bring nothing into into my bank um then then you'll be fine i think i think three months is probably enough i think i had a bit more but in retrospect um i never used it so but yeah i think you need that for the sort of like peace of mind that's really good advice. So I'm wondering, yeah. so you were an employee before, so now you've been doing freelance quite successfully for a few years now. W which one do you like more? Because you mentioned like on the one hand freelance, you can, what I'm hearing is that you can get more flexibility with working on your own stuff on the side. On the other hand, you said it's kind of uh, more stressful sometimes. Like what are the trade-offs and what are you, do you feel like it feels right? Do you like, what are the pros and cons? Like, what do you think? Yeah, uh, well, again, I went through all kinds of sort of like epiphanies, you know, yes, definitely freelancing. And then now I'm sort of like starting to see things kind of like on a more like, what's the opportunity at hand, you know, if the opportunity at hand is a full time job, but it's really what you want to do. And you know, it has, it has potential payoffs in the long term then uh, I, I, I don't think I would say no, freelancing is a better option now. Um, also depends a lot on how, on, on sort of like your working style. Um, like when I was in a full-time role, um, even though, you know, working for a startup can be quite messy, um, you know, I kind, of, I kind of enjoyed that sort of like, you know, at the end of the day, I know that I can leave the, you know, I'll leave the office and everything's going to be fine. Um, uh, but sort of like when you're, when you're freelancing, that you're, it's like kind of everything because like your whole day is potentially a working day. It's, it's, it's totally up to you, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, it's like a, com yeah, a completely different way of, of viewing work. Um, um, also sort of like, I would say the main difference, like the sort of like the main, like the, the way the game's changed since I've been freelancing is that it kind of puts you in control of your, of your timeline in a very unforgiving way. Um, of course, depends a lot. Like there are things to consider, you know, the different factors depending on the, on the project, on, on how you charge, basically, if you charge per hour, if you charge on a sort of like per project basis, all these decisions, even if they seem small, they really change how you, 
plan your work, how you, you know, how you write your code, how you, uh, everything changes from these, based on these things. Again, you know, the sort of like the, depending on how time aggressive or, you know, impatient your client can be, that also, that also influences obviously your, your uh, working sort of practice. But yeah, I would say working as a freelancer is definitely a bit more, uh yeah you i think the best way to say it is like you'll get more sleepless nights i think that's that's for sure so i guess that's not for everyone but it can be quite rewarding um, yeah i mean obviously the benefit is if you're working the extra hours and you've planned things right then the extra hours will be will be essentially cash or whatever your uh, agreement with the with the with the client is um but I, I've, yeah, I, I, we can get a lot into these, but there's like, there's like, a, it's a very complicated sort of like trade-off uh, sort of like space that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So I want to drill down into that a bit later, but yeah. um, maybe since you mentioned um, like your time and time uh, kind of time management, what does your day look like? How do you manage your time? Is there like a fixed window where you work you said like you need to be kind of always on call but also you have like your own stuff going on so how do you manage your day how what does that look like yeah so again depends on how many projects i've i've, I've gone through different stages uh you know there have been times when i had three projects going on and that was definitely too much uh at that in those times i definitely needed to be very organized with my time uh so those, those sort of like times kind of teach you, kind of make you sort of like self-aware, uh, you know, a lot. It's like, for example, like I know that in the, in, the, in the morning, I get like about two hours maybe toward probably three, but like if I've had a really good night's sleep, then I'll get three hours of really deep work and I can solve like, you know, I can solve problems that I've not seen before in the first three hours. So usually when I, you know, when I had a lot of projects going on and there were new things to solve, I, those three hours were just like sacred. Like I would just, I would just go to, a, you know, sometimes even working from a coffee shop, but I, I you know, I, I kind of knew that no one could bother me. Like even at home, sometimes things can interject your, your, uh, your uh, sort of like mind space. Um, so, you know, basically very sacred three hours or whatever your most focused work time of the day is. And then, uh, you know, take a little break or, you know, probably that could mean maybe lunch or something and then come back and I might get like another hour and a half of sort of like solid work. And then, you know, you have all these sort of like interspersed times when you kind of know you're just kind of sitting at your laptop and you, you kind of just know that nothing really productive can happen or like nothing creative can happen but you can do more sort of like brainless tasks i mean i i don't want to say brainless because nothing like when you're writing code is never you know it can't be brainless but you know problems that you've seen before or things that you know fixing bugs that don't require that are, you know trigger a different part of your brain so that that sort of like you know finding the best parts of my brain when you have a very sort of like oh i need to finish this by then this client wants that I, I need to make sure I, I squeeze out mm -hmm. the most out of my day. Um, and I've tried all kinds of sort of like strategies. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't call them strategies. They're kind of just going with the flowing, seeing how you feel a lot. But like there have been days when I've worked on the same day for two, for two clients. They, you know, I've tried for like sometimes working for one week just for one client and two, uh, another week for another. It depends. I, I, I don't think I found like a magic formula. Uh, and you know, yeah. sometimes I try to be very sort of like diligent and organized, uh, and it, that doesn't work either. You just kind of have to listen to your to your flow. You know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about now, but you know, yeah, that's sort of like the the gist. Yeah, I think I can relate to that. Also, the fact that you kind of figure it out as you go along, and it kind of changes as well. Like for me, for example, for a long time, I wasn't a morning person at all. I would like really struggle in the morning. But yeah, I remember. Like, yeah. But then this year I actually gave up uh, coffee. So I'm not actually drinking coffee anymore. And that changed everything. So now, ever since I stopped drinking coffee, I just get up in the morning and I'm like, wow, I'm awake. I want to do stuff. And now, like, what you described, like, the first few hours are, like, the most productive ones. So obviously, yeah. like, 
what I do right now like involves a lot of meetings, a lot of talking to people and like, you know, managing people, managing things as well. So and I try to kind of have that more in the afternoon where, and then in the morning I have these like hours where I can actually do some technical work. But I don't think I've really figured out the magic formula yet either. So like every day it tends to be a little bit different. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, you just need to like listen to your body, listen to your brain and, and just like experiment with different things, I guess, right? Yeah, and then, you know, the clients really dictate what you do in a way, you know, it's like, for example, if there's something that needs to be done by the end of the week, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like amazing to see what you can do when you know there's a hard deadline in front of you. Like sometimes I've, you know, I've had those three hours of productive work, you know, from 7 p.m., there have been times and you know it's like maybe maybe those sort of like schedules i wouldn't be able to do unless i really i really knew i had to finish something i really wanted to finish something and sometimes i'm also sort of like hard on myself as well you know if i've seen i've spent two days or three days on something that should have taken me three hours which is you know, i imagine the story of every programmer mm-hmm. uh then you know if if it's been three days i kind of go really super hard myself like this needs to be finished and i'll just like i'll just whiz through it i write the sh- you know sh- shittiest code that can be possibly written but at least i'll finish it uh and then and then see what happens from from there interesting so yeah, yeah. i mean i remember back in the day we had these things where you would like stay in the office until 1 a.m to finish something but i'm kind of I found that at least for myself, that just doesn't work anymore. This is just not sustainable. So what I'm really trying to do is to have this like separation where at like 6 p.m. or whenever that is, you just kind of close your laptop and you're like, okay, now I'm done. And mm. I'm just not going to look at this stuff anymore until tomorrow. And then the next morning, I, you know, you have these like couple of hours which where you're really productive and focused and that's where you like finish everything. But yeah, of course, like, it's really interesting how everyone's kind of slightly different and this also comes in phases where you have like phases where you just you know burn the midnight oil and other phases where maybe you're kind of a bit more yeah i think i mean i always tell i mean it's just something that's very useful to know and i don't know if it's obvious to everyone but like sort of like kind of like i would say most of the deadlines mm. can be can be moved so that's something that's something you need to know it's like you know, like like project managers or you know sort of like directors and companies you know a lot of the time they set timelines just because it it makes people productive you know it's like even i think there's a law like parkinson's law or someone like who said you know time shrinks or expands to fit available space and that's really true um but you know sometimes sometimes you gotta some sometimes you gotta push that by one or two days by yourself and you know work really hard for those two extra days to get them uh, because because you know they could really make a big difference in the quality or or the outcome of your work so you know i would say always sort of like keep that in mind and i always do that but um i i these days i, I tend to be super sacred with my deadlines if you know if, even if the deadlines that i've set myself or if the deadlines dictated by the client or like sometimes the deadlines because there's marketing sync or whatever they are uh yeah all right that's really interesting so let's talk a little bit more about um kind of the actual work with your clients and everything so how do you how do you actually get a contract like how do you how do you get a client how do you where do you look for contracts and clients? How do you get those things? How do you, you know, yeah. act and get a job basically? Yeah, so that's unfortunately the question that I have, I have the, less, the least sort of like actionable advice to, unfortunately, because I've actually thought about like, I think 90% of the jobs that I've done since I left Rolly have been either directly recommended like through our, you know direct recommendation from someone who i've worked with at Rolly or an indirect recommendation somehow or like someone i've met you know sometimes like you know the contracts i met someone at football who knew that they've heard someone who was looking for you know, that that sort of stuff so it's always been sort of like emails in my inbox rather than me prospecting and sort of like like I've done, I think I've emailed one client once for a job I saw, I think on the Juice Forum or something like that. Um, and it, it, didn't, it didn't go anywhere. It, it wasn't, you know, it, yeah, 
it wasn't the right fit or it didn't it wasn't good at that time uh, so yeah it basically like 95 percent 90 percent have been indirect or direct recommendations yeah I, th I think actually that happens a lot like that happened to me as well like my um you know the project that i'm currently involved in you know the way it happened was i was working you know back in russia in st petersburg in my hometown um at jetbrains not mm -hmm. even doing music tech stuff anymore and then i just got a message from someone someday saying that hey you know um, I've heard from some people at Native Instruments, which was like my job before really, that, you know, you are this and this engineer, you can do these and these things. Do you want to like work on that? I have an idea and you mm -hmm. know, this kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, well, let's, let's talk, you know? And um, it, it seems like this is a common way how this can happen. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe the key is to kind of set yourself up in such a way that you, people kind of know what you do is that like fair to say that that's good advice or? Uh, yeah, that for sure helps. Yeah, you have to, you, you, yeah, you have to make sure. I think this is something that people don't realize. You have to be easy to find online. I think that's, that's super important. Like, you know, you don't have to, you know, go crazy on your blog or, you know, like have, um, you know, all these like Git, GitHub projects. I mean, I, I know a lot of people recommend that, but I think, I think it, you know, even one, like, for example, like a video, like uh, you presenting a topic or you talking about one of your projects, if it's at a conference, then amazing. If it's, if it's just you and a video online on a, on a topic, then that's also super, super helpful. So it's like, you know, for someone who's looking, you know, you just have to put yourself in the, you know, person who's looking for someone to do work right you just have to it's like what's the fastest way for me to get usually in the console like contract business like people people need someone fast like I've, I've i receive a lot of emails uh, from people needing help like less less than a less than a month's notice and i usually don't get involved with those but you know a, a lot of people do that so and you know if you're in that sort of situation is like you need to be able to ev evaluate that the person is right for the job very quickly and if you can do that without having to interact with them, then that's amazing. Like for a, for a sort of like for a contractor freelancer who's just starting out, obviously you won't have like projects that you've done online. You, you know, you're, you maybe you might have your CV if you've worked on a full-time job before, but uh, it doesn't, you know, the, yeah, it, it doesn't always fit. It, it, you know, the, the CV doesn't, doesn't say, you know, how, you know how capable you are in certain areas that the client is looking help you know is is searching help uh, for so yeah i think being available quickly that's that's helpful um obviously linkedin profiles yeah, yes stuff like that they, you know i don't think there can be too many but speaking about being available quickly like how do you juggle that like how do you because you have like maybe your own project going on that you're working with or you have one or two clients that you're already working with how do you juggle yeah. this kind of like multiple clients and someone asking you for you know something on a on short notice like how do you like maybe yeah. these clients even like compete with each other like how do you even yeah <laughs> that's fortunately i've never had competing clients uh, at the same time i can't imagine how that would go but i wouldn't I wouldn't think that would be a problem because at the end of the day, you, you know, most of, most of the times as a contractor, you are, you're approached to, so I don't want to generalize, but generally you're, you're approached to solve a problem that's well-defined. I think, I think people, people generally come to you when you, when they can, you know, they can offload something very easily. You know, if, if you're not part of the team, then you can imagine it's really hard to, play it by ear and say oh you know we yeah we'll see how it goes you know we'll pay you by the hour and you know and yeah we'll see no, it doesn't it yeah it's not a very efficient way to spend your your uh, cash so you need to make sure you have everything carved out properly so you know when someone approaches you like like that then it doesn't really matter if they're competing right they have their own problems anyway you're not like adding intellectual property that that's gonna you know uh, somehow offset it's maybe in the best case scenario you're you're fighting for time like if, if you're really like in some unfortunate situation yes yeah, situation you end up with two clients 
trying to push similar products uh, with similar timelines and you're you know you're the one choosing which client to work first then yeah that might be a that might be a weird situation but no one's gonna know and i don't, I don't think that matters much anyway mm. um uh, but yeah i think most of the times um so you know when i said i worked on you know for three clients at the same time don't don't imagine three demanding clients at the same time like most of the time most of the times i have one long-term project that could be like even you know one year or i think i think yeah maybe one year was the longest like maybe start already took yeah start already maybe took one year uh so it wasn't uh you know it wasn't full time one year you know maybe like i don't know 30 percent or i i don't know like roughly so you know you get these sort of like you you, you kind of get a bit of room for maneuvering right so you know if i if i'm in a if I'm in a, if, if I'm at a point with a client where things are not super hasty and I get an email, Oh, I just need this job for five days. Then I, I might take a five day job really, really quickly. Uh, if I'm, you know, if I'm really busy, then I won't because I know it usually takes a lot more than that, you know? And like, also there's also this sort of like trick is like, it's like, it, t- it takes you five days really to do a job, but in your head, the cost is, is, as if it was 15 days. It's because just, of the context switch or? Not just the context switch, just because you're dealing with a person that you haven't met before. Oh. And you know, it's like, it's like there are all these sort of like internal dialogues going on into your head. If I don't know, at least in, in my head, like, you know, how, you know, do they expect me to react quickly? Do you know, do they want that? Do they want that? Do they, so it's like, you know, how, you know, they are like this. Like, like probing, like you're trying to yeah. figure out the context and like, yeah every person and be kind of reading between the lines what's going on there and things like that right? exactly yeah learning how the person communicates yeah and so there's all this like cost that you don't see so uh, generally I, that's why i said i tend to avoid taking short-term projects because because they cost a lot more than what you're paid by the hour so it's and not- usually i actually ch- charge more for short projects than i charge for long so for long so projects. speaking of charging actually that brings us nicely to the next topic like let's say you have um you know you have a client you have someone who you know approaches you hey do you want to do this with me and you say yes and then you know you, you have time i'm available how do you charge them is it like per project is it per hour how do you figure out how much it costs how do you estimate that and how do you actually how do you actually yeah that? how does that work but yeah let me let me take the book of black arts uh <laughs> <laughs> and do a, a few push-ups and yeah i don't know uh yeah it's very tricky i think it's um it's um it's one of the hardest things i would say that I've had to learn. I, I, I don't know if learning is really the, really the right word here, but to optimize, maybe to, to optimize. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of things that I sort of like plan in. One thing is one thing I know for sure. And this is, this is something that I, I figured out myself. Um, I don't like working when it's paid by the hour. I, I, I personally, don't feel motivated to work for something where I know, you know, at the end of the day, this is, this is going to have, you know, it's like everything is bounded. That's one, one reason I don't like it. The second reason I don't like it is because, is because um, when you're working by the hour, it's like, you're kind of asking to be managed. If you see what I mean, it's like, if you're, if you're asking, you know, if you're, if you're saying to your client, you know, it's going to take me 10, 10 uh, days. There and you know, three days have gone by, and you have nothing to show. They will get like, whoa, whoa, what is this guy doing? You know, and then you know, if you're if you're at the end, you know, at the end of the ten days, and never, never, ever do you do you say, oh, it's going to take me 10, 10 days, and it's locked in stone. It's always going to be, you know, maybe it's going to take me ten days. Um, so you know, it's like you're, you're always kind of asking the client to manage you. If you if you can, I you know, and this is what I try to do. I always try to to ask to make a fixed price quote or like a more of a sort of like per milestone. I, I, I can get into more details about this. Like it's, it's actually there are, you know, different ways I can, I, I, don't, I don't even know how exactly how to describe it, but basically I, you know, that's, this is what I'm trying to point out. Like I prefer to work on a fixed, fixed ish project basis because then it forces me to be in control of time management. It forces me to be more, I would 
say uh, RC on my on my estimates, you know, it's like it, it kind of it just changes the dynamics of the relationship or the the you know the. Uh oh. Uh, it's a very risky thing to do, uh, and I definitely don't do it for I definitely don't do it for short projects. Like if it's. Um, if it's like I don't know, maybe something less than ten days, risky because you don't have much room for error, right? Like if it takes you fifteen days, then you're you're losing money. If it, you know, if it takes you if it takes you less than that, then great. But it never takes you less than that. So, so the yeah. thing that the thing that I'm really wondering is because this is something I bumped against um, as myself in my career again and again and again, both as you know an individual developer and also like on the scale of a whole team or of a whole whole company, um, is like this kind of Hofstetter's law. Like everything takes three times longer than you think, even if you take into account Hofstetter's law. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. But then if you're like forced to um, like just say, you know, this is this is the price for the whole thing or whatever. Like, how do you how do you get around Hofstetter's law? And what do you do if time runs out? Do you do you sacrifice code quality? Do you just go for the quick and dirty approach, or do you do you say, okay, we need to like change the plan now, or like how yeah. solve that problem? Yeah. So they're all vi viable options, I would say. They're all viable options, the one that you've described. The, I would say the first question is, is really is like a sort of like an, on an opportunity basis. Like the first question is, what is this, what is this project really, what is this problem that I'm hired to solve? Is this a problem that I've solved before? If, 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 you know, if you're in that space, then everything's easy. Like, like you know, estimations. I would say Hofstadter's law doesn't apply. If you if you, if you've solved the problem before, then yeah, it's, it's going to take you longer this time because you're going to want to try something new that you haven't done before. You you, you know you your uh, you know your engineering head is going to want to make it somehow better, and it's going to take you longer even the second time. Mm -hmm. But you at least you're not in the oh I really don't know how much this is going to take me space. So it, you know if the answer to that question is I've solved this problem before then easy. If you're in the gray sort of like zone, oh, I haven't really done this before. This is kind of new. There's not much online where I could look on how to solve this problem. Then it gets really, really, really tricky. Um, so, you know, I've been through phases. Like, I think I have now, uh, I have the sort of like a two by two matrix kind of in my head always. So it's like, it's like, you know, there's the sort of like, um, you know, time sort of like axis, and then there's like the you know code quality axis. Uh, you know, the, let's say these are the only two sort of like axes that you're you're going for. It's like you can always crank up that sort of like finish it fast, but compromise on code quality. That's always an option. Uh, at least it works for me. Like, I can definitely finish things much faster if I set myself to do. Um, and a lot of the times you actually find out that things were much easier than you thought. So actually cranking up the sort of like the speed forces you to find solutions that you probably wouldn't have found otherwise if you hadn't spaced out. So, you know, if you're, if you're in the, you know, code quality uh, compromise, but finishing time quadrant, then I would say probably not very de desirable. I, you know, it's, someone's lost somewhere. Uh, <laughs> you, you, everyone can, can take their, you know, sort of like, Conclusion, so yeah. Yeah, I think we've all seen stuff like that happening as well, right? <laughs> yeah. There's obviously the, you know, the first quadrant in the bottom right, which is you don't finish in time and the code is not, is not great either, which is, I would say at, th at, that, at that point, you probably, it's probably okay for you to be losing money. I mean, it, it's, it's probably fair. I mean, that's at least how I see it. You know, if, if, I, if I land in that, you know, if I land in that uh, quadrant, then I I tap my tap my tap myself on the on the back and I go, okay, maybe it's okay for me to, you know, have lower expectations on the on the on the rate that I set myself. Um, for the obviously the other the other quadrant is to you know sort of like finish, uh, write great great quality, but you know negotiate with the client a few more extra hours, you know, say. 
you know, this is really not as easy as I thought, or this is whatever, you know, you'll, you'll have, you, you, you will have reasons. This is very important. You know, every time I've approached a client, you know, if I had to um, change my estimate, there were hard, solid reasons. Why? Because, you know, there's this problem that I have not seen before, you know, there was this library that, you know, there's always something that's much easier to explain when you have it. But, you know, I think, when you're sort of like working in a company and you've navigated the space, you kind of forget that there's the, the magic quadrant in the top right where, you know, you finish in time and the code is great as well. Uh, and I see a lot of discussions online, you know, there's a lot, a lot of sort of like, sort of like advice and, you know, contradiction for people talking about these, these quadrants where, you know, you're not really talking about the top quadrant. Then I think people forget that that should be the aim. It's like, I always set myself this task. It's like, I need to finish in time and the code needs to be great. And just just having that, just aiming for that uh, changes things completely. For for me, like, for example, I've, I have this strategy now where if I'm starting a project uh, and it's, it's, it's aiming to solve something that I've not done before, I always try to get to the finish line as fast as possible. You know, it's like, I don't, like I even, I sometimes see myself writing code that I know that, you know, with just another iteration could be much better right at then. And I still finish that line just to get to the, to the finish line. And you'll be surprised that, for example, if, you know, if you're building projects with GUI and a lot of dependencies and you'll be surprised how much you see if you've crossed the finish line once, you know, you, know, you kind of, you kind of get this bird's eye overview of, of everything. And then it's, it's so much easier to know where to spend more time, where not to spend more time. A lot of the things, you know, become obvious. Like so many times I've seen myself optimizing something that, you know, just shouldn't have existed or like, you know, just wasn't a problem. Like that a lot of the times, even the client doesn't know they need that problem solved. So I, I always, you know, I think I'm, I'm more basic. I think this is, if that's something that freelancing has, has taught me is like, actually for me is more important to, fit, to finish in time and, and if it comes to the cost of code quality, then I will, I will, uh, I will rather sacrifice than that than time. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, that you know that doesn't that doesn't translate as well if you're working in a in a you know in a sort of like software development team. You know, and you you have like a massive production suite, and you know you've got thousands and thousands of clients you know and like every little detail counts like it's a different game like you know every every sort of like situation is different i think it also depends on the lifetime of the code right whether the code you're writing you know whether it still needs to be around 10 or 20 years from now with something yeah. like, you know like the deuce framework or like something like that right yeah or whether it's like okay here's a product but like next year there's going to be like a new product and then there's going to be a new product and stuff i think but yeah, but the, even then, like, I always, you know, I don't, I don't uh, sound, I really don't want to sound like a manager, you know, like some sort of like investor, but you know, it, it's always, it's always a function of how much time you're putting in, how much does that time cost? And what is the potential value created by the product that you're building for your client? And, you know, very often, like, especially in the music industry, I can, I can, I have a sense for that. Like I've seen products released, I kind of, I kind of know how much a product can sell. Like if I can, if I see myself spending 10 days on a, on a flanger, that's, you know, that's just doing exactly the same thing that, you know, it's like, I just know that's just not efficient time spent. So no one's winning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like, there, there are some things that just, that have a time boundary where code really does not care. You know, right. sorry, the, the code quality is just not important because it's a, it's a, it's a loss uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, um, but a sort of market. But I have a question here, though. So, mm. all right. So let's say you know you finish the project, and then either you end up in this like top quadrant where you really want to be, where you have uh, great co co quality, and you finished on time, or maybe you finished on time but you didn't spend ten days perfecting the flanger, but you you know cut some corners, and maybe the quality is like so so. Like regardless of that, you're done, okay? But that's just not, that's not where it ends, right? Because now you're gonna release a product and now someone's gonna to have to maintain it. Someone's gonna to have to fix bugs. Someone's have to like re respond to like feature requests. Like how does, how does this maintenance aspect work? This is totally not clear to me at all. 
Yeah, so for, um, for, let me think in terms of the projects that I've done. So I think for most of the projects I've, I'm still the one who's maintaining them in a sort of like, you know, uh, passive <clears throat> capacity. So on most contracts that I do with, with clients, we always discuss a maintenance plan, which is, you know, if something comes up, then what, what sort of like ranges should I be looking at? Like, like much, you know, what, I mean, how, how many weeks should I expect uh, for you? To, sorry, what's the responsiveness uh, that I should ex expect from you? Like, would you jump in in a sort of like at a week's notice? You know, do you jump in at a two weeks notice? So there's always that discussion to have. You know, what sort of rate should I be expecting? So for most of the projects that I do, uh, they involve some sort of plan where I am incentivized to, you know, fix the bugs that I've written, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. honestly. Um, um, but, you know, for most projects that I've done, you know, there was always like, a, you know, a delivery stage where, you know, the products get, gets delivered to the client and then he, he tests like I do preliminary testing uh sort of like in-house you know uh, either me or my my brother would would test it depending on who's written the code so there, there's always a bit of testing but then you know the client tests it again depending on their you know on the complexity of the of their product you know they might get a lot of coverage they might get little coverage so very rarely has it happened that you know I've shipped a shift shipped a project and the clients come back to me like, oh, nothing's working. Uh, you know, oh, this is not, you know, that's never happened. I, I, I think, I, at least I haven't, you know, I haven't received any angry emails uh, so far. Ho hopefully this won't be the, the start of that. And it's not an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I hope it's going to be okay. Um, yeah. But I see your point. No, I, I definitely see your, see your point. Like it really depends on the projects. And I think maybe the projects that you have in mind are not really, are not really sort of like freelancer business. Yeah, because it's, if you have like a code base, which is living for years and years and years, then actually 90% of the cost is in the maintenance, right? Often. Yeah. But for other projects that like that equation is completely different. So I think, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying that this just completely depends on the project. Yes, yes. How many users you have and who these users are and you know what what they expect and things like that. Yeah, for sure. But I, I just think it, it helps to have these things in, in mind and you know, at least to, to know what your you know at least to know the, the the map that you're that you're walking on. You know, I, I think a lot of engineers forget that uh, actually finishing in time is very important. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I can yeah. get, and, get, you get know, behind that. <laughs> Yeah, and as, you know, especially manager, you know, as a as a manager, it's it's not helpful to put time pressure or, or time pressure on developers working on difficult problems. You know, not not. Everyone it's a fine line, problems, though, right? Like if you pressure. you can do do this like yeah. unconstrained engineer perfectionism thing, where you're just never going to be finished because you want to get everything perfect. But then you also have this like immovable deadline thing, where like you know, whatever happens, we need to release on that day, which is also not very healthy. And the truth kind of lies somewhere in between, right? And this is, yeah, I think the fine line to work and yeah. also massively depends on the project. But um, yeah, I guess that's- Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we kind of now got to kind of a rough understanding of like how this all works. Um, and so, you know, you got a contract, you're working on it, you, you have an estimate, you negotiate, you work on it, then you deliver it, and then you, you have some kind of deal to do maintenance. Okay, great. Um, but there's like other things that you, I guess that you do, which are kind of beyond just working on the projects. Like for example, what I'm wondering is, is there like a community of freelancers? Do you keep in touch with them? Hmm. Do you like, is it like an online community of like different freelancers who like help each other out or is it like a very solitary kind of thing like i don't know is there like something beyond what you do that you're kind of a part of or do, would you not see it that way i uh, well i would love to see it that way it's just it, it hasn't like something i've noticed since i've been freelancing is um 
I actually get a lot less time to, you know, watch online talks. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have that sort of like mental space that often uh, mm. to, you know, participate in extra, well, not extra professional stuff. It, it is still professional, but, you know, in a more sort of, oh, you know, what should I do with my hour? That, that kind of, that is, is not happened to me in the last two years and a half. And I, I say it with, say it with sorrow. <laughs> Well, but, I made, um, actually made an exception for us and came here. <laughs> ah, no, no, it's fine. No, this is, this is, uh, this is fun. But you know, it's like things like this. You know, if, it was actually quite helpful because you know me and Timur met and we talked about this. So I was kind of invested as well in this conversation. So this, this is great. Uh, but you know, if I am myself, I, I yeah, I sometimes some some you know something needs to come on my plate in a way for me to. To really invest time, oh. okay, uh, which 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 is not something I I, I definitely definitely not enjoy. <laughs> All right, so I think there's quite a few people who have um, questions to you on the chat as well. So I want to get to some of those, but um, let me ask you one last question. So for someone okay. who's just considering getting into freelance, like what is like the number one thing you would recommend them? Hmm the number one thing like you re if you want to do this stuff you really need to know this <laughs> like sorry if i'm putting you on the spot there but like it's it's no of, it's not on the spot what's I like, am... or like maybe what's like a thing that you wish you had known when you were getting into this there was a time when i knew i i knew this one i actually there was there, there have been times when i kind of was like oh this uh, but now it doesn't it doesn't um it doesn't come into my head. I I don't think there are various things that I wish I knew. All right. Um, so maybe some of them will come up now in the. Oh, I think I know. I think I know. Okay. So, yes, this is the one thing that you should know. It's like, freelancing is not an is not an end game. I think that's the that's the that's the gist. If somehow you've you've built in your head that freelancing is somehow uh, you know step forward to a full-time position in any way uh, de definitely not um i think the end game is for you to uh invest as little time as possible into something uh that then gets launched into the world and then just generates value just because it exists and you don't do anything that's the end game uh if freelancing gets you there amazing if freelancing is just a way of you for you to you know uh, crank up that uh, cash inflow good but not as a long term solution it, it it you know it can be done and it's definitely you know something i i mean i don't i definitely don't have anything against that but i i don't think it should become a a lifestyle for a, for anyone hmm. all right well that's yeah. great to know thank you so much for your valuable insights um, no, thanks. That learned was really... a lot from this conversation. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting to hear your your questions. Yeah. Wow. Thank you very much for that, Vlad. That was very insightful. I mean, I have a hundred. I have a hundred thousand questions. This this could probably easily <laughs> turn into a th a three hour conversation between us, but uh, I will That's let. Fine. I'm here. I will let the uh, I will let the audience ask the questions first. So some of these have been pretty much covered in your conversation, but uh, one person asks. Um, I'll, I will rephrase their question because I think I understand what they're getting at. Uh, when did you know that you were ready for freelancing? So uh, hmm. you know you're programming, you're you're doing your thing. You worked at Roly. When did you When did you have a good feeling that Okay, I'm ready to make a transition into hmm. doing this on my own. Oh, huh. yeah, I see. I never thought of it like that. I think if I look back now, I probably wasn't ready when I started, if you know what I mean. Um, it's like one thing I knew for sure is like I had been working with Juice at the time that I went freelancing for, I think it was already like three years at Roly. Uh, and you know being next to Jules also helps it, it kind of 
you know, it kind of, uh, it, it, it does speed up things. At least you don't have to go to the juice forum anymore. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, there's an efficiency in, in, in that channel. Um, obviously, you know, you know, there are people like him with, you know, Fabian also is, uh, you know, amazing. You know, everyone at Volleyball Supreme. So, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't want to put a timestamp to that, like three years and then I was ready. Uh, but I knew when I moved into the next job that it was, it was juice based. So the client was working with uh, juice. They were actually people I worked with at Trolley. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, it's kind of hard to answer that because for me, it was obvious that that was, uh, there were, there were not that many risks in that, in that move. Mm -hmm. um, if you are, you know, if you're considering of making this change and you don't have a job lined up and you, you know, you're, you're willing to sort of like take the risk of like, oh, let's see what happens. Then I have no advice for you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, some of these other ones, some of these other ones have already kind of been answered. So I'm going to skip through them. Uh, another question is about client communication. How do you communicate timeframes to, to your client? Do you give them a range? Do you give them, do they give you the, the deadline? Uh, that's the first question I, I ask. Basically the first question I ask is like, mm -hmm. how, um, uh, yeah, how uh, how you know how tight on on uh, on time are you? That's that's literally the first question. If they you know if they come back and they say, oh, it needs to be done by then, then I work backwards from there. And if I end up on the other side of the ocean, then I say no. Mm. If I end up you know if if I end up somewhere close, then I mean the oh we can work with the space, uh, you know. In that sort of like space, I depends on the you know the length of the project. I tend to sort of like break it down in as many modules as possible you know i i i, I always I, I always approach it on a sort of like build build sort of like vertically uh, first and then expand sort of like horizontally so i run through all the modules really quickly in a in a first milestone i kind of group it yeah group things in milestones and then each milestone in its own sort of like sub phase in a way so and then, you know, I make like a final proposal where, you know, each milestone is sort of like quoted and then each phase is quoted. And then I always put an asterisk and say, you know, the prices for the sub milestones are kind of rough, you know, there's overlap, there's always overlap, you know, I kind of, you know, so I, I, I yeah, that's how I kind of go in my, in my planning stage. And then in my, uh, you know, in my estimation to the client, I kind of go, I zoom out first and then keep zooming in. And I, that's sort of like, high res to sort of like low res to high res that's that's also seen in the in the in the estimates that i uh, that i make so you know i, I usually say you know this will take uh, you know I, I can finish this by then and it will cost about this i can finish this by then and it will cost this and i send them a huge proposal like it's it's you know that's that's one of the sort of like the tricky things because very often like i'm spending actually considerable time on making these proposals uh, and not considering that time in the in the uh, in the bill to, to say so. So, uh, you know, that's another thing. Is like when you when you know you have to make, and when you know you know it's your money in the in the game, then you're you're really putting the extra mental effort to see through possibilities, um, and you know make you know plan things through properly. So yeah, I I, I try my best to give you know on a to give estimates on a, you know, module milestone iteration, sort of like, you know, if there's something to be found out, for example, you know, if we're working on something we don't know the answer to, and, you know, the next phase depends on that answer, then I will, I will phase it in a sort of like iteration base. So sometimes, you know, our projects where I go, oh, we know what to do here. And then there's a, oh, we have to try some things out here. And I go, oh, we allocate two iterations of two weeks for this. Each iteration will cost this. Uh, it, you know, take this amount of time. If this happens, then we can finish with one iteration. You know, it's it just a big, a big uh, sort of like decision tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and each, each, uh, each, uh, each node has like some sort of range to it, like a plus minus days range kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if that, yeah, if that helps. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I think I already know the answer to this question, but I said that I would ask, uh, 
how much, uh, like, do you have a, st- a static fee that you charge for maintenance or is that kind of built into your overall proposal at the very beginning where you talk, where you say, okay, after this project, because of course, once, you know, when you're talking about a project, you know, from your experience, there's going to be some, uh, some work that's going to come afterwards. Do you, yeah. uh, is there normally like a static rate that you charge for that or do you just, uh, how do you factor that in? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I tend to go with a per hour, um, rate for that sort of like maintenance plan. Okay. Uh, just, just so that the client kind of, you know, knows if something happens, you know, it, it just helps them calculate, you know, budget, uh, and, you know, sort of like risk tolerance in a way, you know, it's like your, your, your role is in that position. It's like, I've got this cash and I need to make sure I hit the, the finish line. Mm. Um, I do, I do like most of like most of the projects that I work on these days are kind of projects where I kind of really want to be part of. So I, I, I say no more often than I say yes these days. And even if that means I'll be making a lot less. So for projects where I really want to, you know, be part of, I, you know, for the maintenance plan, I kind of tend to try to negotiate, you know, uh, sort of like a sales royalty or some sort of like, you know, long-term compensation plan uh which also incentivizes me to do the best job possible so that that's the sort of like i would say dream scenario that i always aim for you know i hope you know i always aim for i always want to say yes like i i have this sort of like rule which i which i uh borrowed from um this guy his name is naval he's like a silicon valley investor thingy and he's saying like if it's not a definite yes it's a no oh, yeah. and i kind of use that I use that heuristic now in my uh, sort of like client picking and, you know, yeah. thankfully so far I've been in the position to be able to say no more often than I can say yes. Mm. But you know, at the beginning, I definitely wasn't in that space. So, yeah. Mm. Interesting. So, um, I mean, I have, I have loads of questions and discussion items, but I think, I think Alan had a question that he wanted to ask. So I'll let, I'll let Alan go first. Yeah, I, I had a couple for Vlad. Um, the first one is more of kind of like a mental state kind of question. Um, I'm sure a lot of us, um, especially um, my, myself included, um, when, we, when we work, we, we often have an imposter syndrome. And mm. so I feel like when you're freelancing, like imposter syndrome would like reach like a next level. And so my question is like, have you experienced that yourself? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, so I, I'm kind of like, I've, I've been through phases of this, but, um, what tends to, oh, he froze Uh-oh. very often. I kind of, sorry. Yeah. You froze for a second. Me? Yeah. Go start again. Yeah. I think very often I'm kind of just comfortable with that feeling because, um, really it's like you know you're in a space where problems dictate like you don't know the yeah you don't know all the problems so it's like i would feel that's you know that that's like just a natural feeling to have in it and it's the right feeling to have you know you must Mm. you must be humble to the problem that you're approaching but that should not influence the price you you uh, you ask for so mm. I always, I kind of, I kind of keep my head in a sort of like what, you know, so like there's a sort of like inflationary sort of like theory probably there as well. But I always try to charge, you know, the price that is right for the market, not the price that I mm-hmm. feel is right. Because you're always underselling yourself if you think, if you, if you, if you let the imposter syndrome influence your, uh, your, uh, you know, the, basically the value that you ascribe to yourself at the end of the day, you know, it's like you should always, you should always probably triple or maybe like times, times by four the value that you think you're worth because that's what you will be worth by the time you finish that, finish that project in that space and with, you know, with that problem. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you're always undercharging yourself, if you're always undercharging based on that imposter syndrome, then you're always going to be one step behind the market, right? Mm-hmm. That's how I see it. Okay. So I, I guess it would be safe to say that when you first started out freelancing, um, 
you weren't essentially undercharging or yeah, you weren't undercharging your clients. You were like right from, uh, uh, right from day one of freelancing, you were charging what the appropriate market price would be. Uh, there have been a few projects where I definitely didn't, I wasn't happy with the final, you know, count of days, oh, okay. and, you know, uh, but not so unhappy such that, such that it wasn't a good deal. Do, do you okay. see what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like also what I mentioned earlier is also probably a good, a good buffering technique as well for, for your errors in estimation, maybe. Mm -hmm. If you know, if I usually factor that in in different ways in the project proposal, but generally, I think you want to put in as many safety nets as possible. And uh, very often, you know, the you know the client will come back and say that's too much, or they just won't reply to your email anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and that probably means, yeah, it probably it probably is the right thing. You know, if you if you didn't get it, probably they had you know, the budget was completely different to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're either not the right person, or they shouldn't be building that product in the first place. right <laughs> so you don't want to be part of those definitely like like the worst like the worst thing is 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 meeting clients who are super demanding and also have very tight tight budgets and you right. actually see that quite often in the in the audio audio industry mm. as you okay. as you might as you might uh, yeah it's, it's not it's not finance you know like m most of the you know most of the people like either indie companies or you know, very often you get, you know, very big companies who are being profitable for years on end. So it, it's a very healthy, it's a very healthy uh, space to be in, I would say. You okay. know, it, it teaches you, teaches you the, the right lessons about the value of money and time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. I just had one other question. Um, and uh, suppose uh, you weren't able to uh, meet a deadline in time or you've find that something is, um, you're, you're going to have to charge more. Uh, my question is like, how do you approach the client when you essentially ask for more time? Yeah. Well, uh, most of the times I, I don't ask for more time, um, out of their own pocket because I try mm. to, I, I try to give a fixed price quote. So usually it's, it's much easier to approach them to say, ah, it's going to take a, a week more than I thought because they'll go, Okay, cool. Oh, really? Right? <laughs> of course. Oh, well, of course, if that doesn't cost them more, am I right? But if you know, oh, that's if it's, true. Yeah. If you, you know, if it, if it's, uh, if it's, um, you know, if they have to sync with, like, usually this is what dictates hard deadlines, which are not affected by, by budget, right? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's things like you know, the product release was planned for this date, and the marketing team has prepared this, and you know, there's some sort of like interdepartmental sync, mm -hmm. or you know, there's. I don't know. There's always, you know, reason. There are always reasons yeah, like I've that. Definitely so, seen yeah. that in companies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I've I've not had a. You know, I think I think a, a good planner, like a, someone who's had experience uh, in in the industry or like just software experience in in general as a manager, will always buffer on their side as well. So what, what tends to happen is you're buffering on your side. They, you know, they're buffering on your side. Uh, on their side and you know things things work out somehow magic mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah okay. yeah, yeah that, that's all the questions i had over to you josh yeah yeah just to touch on that as as i've experienced uh quite a few projects now and just to touch on that question my advice is communication you just have to really mm -hmm. communicate with the client and you really have to let them know up front that uh, what the expectation is that sometimes things do overrun. Sometimes things do not run to plan. Sometimes there might be a bit of time that you have to kind of R and D things in order to get to the next stage. But the biggest thing is just transparency with the client and communication with them every step of the way, letting them know where you're at, where, you know, your teammates are at and so on and so forth. So just have to let them know, don't let them know when it's too late. <laughs> yeah for sure know, yeah you know let them know as soon as possible when you when you see things aren't going to plan the best thing to do is just get on an email get on a call really quick and say look you know this is happening i think that something's going to come up you know this is this is kind of where we're at so yeah um, i have a i have a sort of like self self sort of like radar role like if you're getting an email from the client how are things going 
it's a really bad sign. Mm. So I, if, if you ever get that email, you know, how are things going? I just wanted to check in. You're not doing something well. So I think that just sort of like doubles up sort of like Josh's point. Like you need to be proactive about your communication with your client. Like yeah. you know, if things are taking longer then yeah, let them know before they ask you. <laughs> yeah. I, I had a question. I had a question um, for you. And this is something that I've seen with a lot of, uh, I see a lot of people in the community that try to take a, that are looking to make a transition towards freelancing. And, um, you know, one of the big things is that on top of the software engineering, you have what you were talking about before, which is the client, client relationship, you know, budgeting, you know, now you're your own mm -hmm. project manager. Um, in, in your company with your brother, do you divide those duties up or do you just, is it just kind of a free for all? How do you, how do you actually handle that? Because, uh, I could imagine that if you're, if all of both of you are trying to do all of those things that it may, that maybe it could be a challenge to just switch your context all the time from being in a programming mindset to yeah. being a project management uh, mindset. Yeah, well, for us, it's very, it's very simple in that, uh, uh, in that sense, because um, I'm definitely more um, experienced, at least in this industry as well. Um, so uh, between me and my brother, it makes a lot more sense for me to be doing the planning and all the technical sort of like management stuff. Uh, so what we tend to do is like, you know, when there's a new project, you know, I organize, I do, I do a lot of sort of like, you know, I, basically when I talk to my brother about planning things specifically, it's usually, oh, you know, you can jump on this phase, you know, you can jump on this milestone, you can do this. But obviously, I, I keep, you know, we work across the same desk, right? So, you know, we, we do talk a lot in, informally, but I don't think I've reached that point where delegation has become a problem or, yeah. you know, definitely, especially not with my, with my, uh, um, you know, uh, brother, obviously. Yeah. 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 I think, I think um, you brought up a, I think, uh, I think to touch on another great point uh, that you brought up earlier, and this is, this brings up a question. So many people, and I'm sure the, the, the question that is in everybody's mind is how much do you charge? you know, for this mm. and, uh, you know, uh, you know, what do you charge? And what I tell, uh, one thing that you touched on earlier that I think is great, maybe uh, I hope a lot of people didn't overlook was, well, how much is the client going to make off of this thing that you build? You know, mm. if you, if you build something and you build it for a thousand dollars and they can make, and they can make a hundred thousand dollars off of the product that you've built from start to finish. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a rip off, isn't it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It depends yeah. though. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, definitely... I know it's, I know that's, I know that's a simplification, you know, I, yeah. know, that's, I, I know that's an oversimplification, um, you know, especially, especially when you're not the only person that's involved in that product life cycle, you know, where you, you know, if you're doing like, to another business and that business has marketing teams, they have project managers that they have to employ. They have, a, uh, they have, you know, more, um, you know, they have an entire software team that you're integrating yeah. with things like that. It's a much bigger picture, much more complex, but, um, you know, there, I, I, I think that I know that in my price, in my pricing to my clients, you know, a big, uh, you know, a big part of the consideration and what this is going to cost is, well, what's the market potential here in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, how difficult is the problem? How difficult is the problem to solve? You know, like at this. Yeah. This I think that's the right question to yeah. ask. Yeah. I, I generally, I generally don't like to, I like, you know, obviously the market that the product will be exposed to is a huge, it's kind of like it's like a you know like a like a hidden voice there that tells you oh yeah you can you can you can crank things up, but I I I, I try my best to think how much value am I really like what is it that I'm actually doing if someone's asking me to write them a JSON parser or I don't know that's a bad like a you know an SFZ parser okay that, there aren't many SFZ parsers out there by the way or at least I haven't found many that are open source that, <laughs> so you know if someone's asking you to do something like that like, it's like this just clearly like it's just a thing to be built and it's like I, I, 
I, I, sorry, I, I don't have the guts to ask for value pricing. You know, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna time, I'm just gonna time box my my hours. Mm. I, if someone's calling me to solve a problem that that I'm really good at solving, and you know, it's like there's there's also sort of like an efficiency factor involved. Like I can finish it much faster, obviously. Mm-hmm. Then there's also sort of like you know, I really have insights in this particular problem. Like I've done these things before. You know, it's like that if you know that's one thing if you know there's a sort of like oh it covers many areas and i'm really the one at the intersection and i can sort of like i can sort of just grab this whole problem and kind of bang it in like a few months then i i think that my value should be Mm non-linear so in that sort of case usually usually i do my best to sort of like value price it in a way but like i'm like i mentioned before you know it's like I really want to be like the ideal is you work on projects where you really, really, really think it's a it would be a great hit in the long term. So in that case, I do my best to take a bit of risk on my side as well and say, look, I'm willing to actually lower my my hourly rate in exchange for some sort of royalties that involve risk on my side. Mm -hmm. And then am I only then am I in a position to be expecting non-linear returns from the work that I do. I think I that's the, so that's, oh, sorry. Yeah, that, that's kind of, that, that's kind of how I, how I see things in terms of, yeah. But I guess of, then you're also committed to it on a different level, right? If it's just yeah. like a mercenary, you're paid by, by the hour, that's one thing. If you're actually committed to making something a success, I think that's like a bit of a different game, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've been to phases where it's really purely been a monetary uh, sort of like motivation. That's fine too, but uh, yeah, it depends. It depends. Like the end, I would say it's not the end game. That I mean, it kind of goes, yeah, goes back to the, yeah. Like I am definitely more motivated when it's something that I really believe in or like where I really, I have, I have a bit of a stake, if, you know, even if it's a personal sort of like stake or it's some, you know, experience stake or some, some sort of stake. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Any other uh anything else from you, Teamer? Uh no, I think I think we're good. I definitely learned a lot. Um so thank you so much. Yeah. I did yeah, have thanks for, I mean we could keep me. talking for another two hours, I guess, but <laughs> let's just we just need to it's like with coding, you can't really finish, you can just stop, you know? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I did I did have another question, but I can't I can't remember it now. So I should have written it down. Uh, that, that'll, <laughs> that'll be the one that'll be the one for part two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, great. Okay. So uh I think that it's a good time to wrap up. Okay. Uh yeah, thank you, Alan. Um oh there was a question for Alan actually asking if he actually freelances. Do you freelance, Alan? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. Are you, are you working for a company? It's been on or? my mind a lot though. <laughs> yeah. Are you with a company or do you, uh, uh right now? No, okay. uh, I'm not working. Okay, cool. Thankfully it gives me a lot of time to work on my own projects that I could never get around to while that was working. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, well, I guess it's a good time for our outro. So, uh, once again, thanks to everybody who has been tuning in. Uh, to continue the conversation, be sure to join us on uh, on Discord at uh, theaudioprogrammer.com forward slash community. We have the link below in the description. Uh, once again, ADC is in a month. Uh, on the 18th and 19th, be sure to get your tickets. Thank you again to our sponsors, Juice, Focusrite, and Sonix for, uh, for helping to make the meetup possible. And thank you to Alan and Vlad for joining us and Teamer for co-hosting. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say one more thing is if you want to be on the show and you want to give a talk about some technical thing you did or you're excited about or you want to do a Q&A or something else, go to theaudioprogrammer.com slash submit. Is that the right URL, Josh? That's it. That's the one. And, and submit your idea and then you can be on the show too. And everyone's welcome. And we love to hear from different corners of the audio industry and... Um, hear about new stuff that people are doing and things you're thinking about things you want to share with the world and with the community so submit a talk get on the show and um yeah yeah uh, with that um thank you so much for listening
thank you, Alan Vlad, um, for being part of this um, this month. Thank you, Josh, for co-hosting. It's fun every month. We'll be back um, next month, every second Tuesday uh, of the month. Yep. So um, yeah. yeah, every it's second okay. Tuesday, and we have our we have our speakers, but I will announce them uh, early next week. So I'll just hold Especially off. Actually, the week before ADC, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the week before. Yeah. Right. So, so that's going to be yeah, it's going to be an interesting month next month. Yeah. So uh, looking forward to that. Yes. Yes. Cool. All right. Thanks everybody, and uh, see you soon. See you soon. Yeah. Have a nice see evening. Bye. 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 -bye.